sound should be working. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Jenna Hamid. I'm the programs manager here at the Center for Book Arts. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our final spring broadside reading series. It's been postponed for the past few months and we are so excited to close out the series tonight on this October day. So for those who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, the Center for Book Arts is located in the heart of Manhattan on Broadway and 27th Street. Um, our space is dedicated to exploring the book as an art object. Um, we host exhibitions, classes, residencies, poetry events, um, lectures, and so much more. Uh, since the pandemic, we've hosted much of our programming online, um, and this being one of them. We recently opened our space back up to, for studio use, um, and next week we are opening up three new exhibitions. Um, and I actually want to invite all of you to join us for our online reception. So our reception will be held completely online and you get to have a first glance view of what, what we'll be exhibiting in our space. So that's happening next week at 6.30 p.m. and you can see our website for details. Tonight, we have two poets who will be reading with us tonight. Anne Duplan and Zara Patterson. This is part of a larger series that we hold twice a year called the Broadside Reading Series, where we bring in a curator from the literary world to bring together six poets <clears throat> who actually collaborate with six different artists on creating an edition of Broadsides. So this past spring, we had Asya Wadud, um, and she brought in a number of artists, of wonderful poets that have read in the month of May. And we have those readings actually available on our YouTube channel. Asya has been extremely thoughtful and mindful and graceful throughout the entire series. And I actually wanna thank her so much for that and for her flexibility. We postponed the reading in light of the uprisings happening in the street to be reflective and in solidarity and focused on what was happening. So, uh, and also everything with the pandemic, we, we wanted to regroup and, um, you know, the, uh, the poets, the artists, the curator all waited patiently for the right moment to reconvene and host this final reading. So thanks so much to Asya, the poets and the artists for being so flexible and, and understanding and, and um, yeah, it, it was a really important time. Um, oh, and, and earlier today, we called this the Eternal Spring Broadside Reading Series. That's Asya's, <laughs> Asya's word. Um, so she'll tell you a little bit more about what tonight will entail, but today will be a bit different. We're gonna hear from the two poets and following the reading, we'll also hear from four out of the six artists who designed Broadsides this series. Um, they'll be sharing a few words about their design and collaboration process, um, and you'll get a, an in-depth experience on what each broadside represents. It's going to be very interesting and, and very intriguing. Um, if you're interested in purchasing a broadside, if you haven't already purchased one, you can go back to the event page and make a purchase through there. Um, you have until 9 p.m. The tickets will close after that. Um, our broadsides will then be available in our bookshop um, in, in the next few days. So uh, go to the Eventbrite page and then go under registration and the broadsides are listed under um, add-ons. Um, this program would not be possible without our funders, the New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of Andrew Cuomo and New York State Legislature and the New York Department for Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. We'd also like to thank our members and all of our supporters. Um, 
the, this has been a very challenging time for all of us. So we've gotten a lot of support from, from a number of people in our summer appeal. So thanks so much to, for everyone for their support. And if you're interested in donating after this, you can go to, you can go to centerforbookarts.org slash support to, to learn more. All right, so I'm gonna introduce our curator who will take the rest of the evening away. Asya Wadud is the author of Cross Light for a Young Bird, Day Pulls Down the Sky, a Filament in Gold Leaf, which was written collaboratively with Akpak Wasili. She is also the author of Syncope and forthcoming, No Knowledge is Complete Until It Passes Through My Body. Asya is a resident at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, Council and is a writer in residence at Dance Project Platform. You can find her work in Eflux Journal, Bomb Magazine, Social Text Journal, Fence, and elsewhere. She currently lives in Brooklyn, where she teaches poetry at St. Anne's School. Now I welcome Asya Wadudz. Yay, hi everyone. Jenna, thank you so, so very much for, um, for the warm welcome and for hosting us one more time tonight. And um, it's been such a long time coming and I'm so glad that we could have a moment just to gather tonight and, um, and, and have this reading. This is, a, as Jenna mentioned, this is um, part of the spring broadside reading. We're using spring very liberally and broadly at this point in 2020. So this is the eternal spring broadside reading, final series. Um, we had Benjamin Kruisling and Mayfield Brooks in the very first reading back in May, which feels like a very long time ago at this point. And then we had Selena Sue and Anna Gerton Wachter for the second reading. And then tonight, we are so fortunate um, to have our final reading tonight with Zara Patterson and Anais Dupin. So I just wanna say a few words about um, about the course of the evening and what to expect. And, um, and then I'll introduce, I'll introduce Zara and Ann, and Zara will read first, and then Ann will read, and, um, and then we'll have a few words from four of the six broadside artists, and then we will close out with a Q&A. So thanks everyone so very much for joining us tonight. And I am just gonna say a few words by way of introduction, and then we'll get started without further ado. For me, says Anais in an interview, quote, the truth is not interesting. I like frameworks and models of reality and thinking about poems as parallel universes to ours, where reality unfolds almost like it does for us here on earth but slightly differently. In poems, for example, it's possible to be all the multiple genders at once, end quote. And that's from an interview between um, Ann and Madison MacArthur from this past April. This reminds me of Zara Patterson's work in chronology, which Sarah Timmer Harvey writes about as, quote, arguably more of a box than a book, a capsule of the writer's personal and political landscape containing so many loose pieces that keeping it intact requires physical care. Personal notes, diary entries, and photos are interspersed with essays on the politics of translation, post-colonialism, activism, history, and connection, forming a narrative that firmly deconstructs its own relationship to chrono chronological order and time." End quote. Both Ann and Zara's work, in both Ann and Zara's work, the truth as a static veneer set of facts and objects is dismantled. Their work is investigative and humble in the questions that it brings to bear. There are often more questions than answers. A pursuit is acknowledged and the end line of the pursuit keeps shifting. Chronology and its antecedents like order and if then are open and unfinished. In this unfinished space, a different kind of cohesion can be understood. And I'm grateful for the ways that their work invites new questions. There's a tacit expectation that something else will emerge. In the acceptance of a shattered or screwed chronology, clarity does not come. Keely Skinner writes in full stop about Zara Patterson's chronology, quote, clarity never seems to come. Instead, the slim volume seems to be Patterson's way of handing the evidence over to the reader. No map, 
no conclusions, no chronology. The act of reading feels akin to debriefing with a friend. I can't make sense of this, can you? The impulse to help pull it together collectively, to work through the contradictions, to hold space for the painful and uncertain is all the same, an emotional pang, end quote. This also takes me to the willingness to let grief hold its space, which I find in both Anne and Zara's work. In an interview between Anne and Ingrid Lafleur from the springtime, Anne says, quote, what does it mean to always be in the process of losing and grief and mourning, but at the same time working your way toward greater and greater cohesion? He goes on to say, I think it's pretty common and I would say socially acceptable for people to be in a kind of mourning and we don't talk about it that much but it's there and we see it pop up for people in different ways, end quote. In personal grief and collective and black grief, language sometimes plays tricks on us. We think we see one thing, but it's really something else. Both Ann and Zara get up close to tactile feelings and they use all manner of ex experimentation and trial to bring to life something emergent. Zara Patterson is a writer and educator her polyvocal collage-like essay, Chronology, from Ugly Duckling Press 2018, received a Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Memoir and Biography. She is the creator of Raw Fiction, a one-time, twice-done youth literary arts project. Her projects have been supported by the community of literary magazines and presses, Mount Tremper Arts, Brooklyn Arts Council, the Pratt Center, and many wonderful individuals. Zara's broadside was designed by Claudia Cortinez. Andupan is a trans poet, curator, and artist. He is the author of the forthcoming book of essays, Black Space and the Poetics of an Afro Future from Black Ocean 2020. I think it actually just came out a couple of days ago, in fact. Congratulations, An. Um, a full length poetry collection, Take the Stallion from Brooklyn Arts Press in 2016, and a chapbook, Mount Carmel and the Blood of Parnassus from Monster House Press in 2017. His writing has been published by Hyperallergic, PBS NewsHour, the Academy of American Poets, Poetry Society of America, and the Bettering American Poetry Anthology. Dupan is the founding curator for the Center for Afrofuturist Studies, an artist residency program for artists of color based in Iowa City. As an independent curator, he has facilitated artist projects in Chicago, Boston, Santa Fe, and Reykjavik. Dupan's video and performance work has been shown at Flux Factory, Data Editions, and the 13th Baltic Triennial in Lithuania, Matthew Gallery, Neuhaus, the Paseo Project, and will be exhibited at the Institute of Contemporary Art in LA in 2020. He was a 2017-2019 Joint Public Programs Fellow at the Museum of Modern Art and the Studio Museum in Harlem. He now works as Program Manager at Recess and Adjunct Assistant Professor in Poetry at Columbia University. Um, and his broadside will, will be designed by Devin N. Morris. Okay, so Zara is gonna read first, as I said, for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then Ann will read for about the same amount of time. And then we'll pause for a moment. I'll quickly just introduce the broadside artist, and they will each say a few words about their design process for each broadside. And then we will have a Q&A. Okay, so welcome Zara. Thanks everyone for being here. Hi, thank you for that beautiful introduction, Asia. It's really wonderful to be a part of this series and excited to be reading with Anne tonight. Um, and thank you, Jenna, for coordinating this. Um, I'm going to share three pieces with you tonight. I'm not really going to pause in between. And um, just to let you all know, the last one was created for this event especially and it's dedicated to the artist who chose the poem for the broadside that she's making. So thank you, Claudia, for, um, for inspiring me to revisit this, um, this old material. So I'm going to read from a very new piece. It's called uh, Policy. It's, uh, it's a the speaker keeps going to um, the speaker is a season ticket holder for an avant-garde theater, essentially. And we go to different performances and see um, kind of a new response to what's happening in the world. I don't know if I am at a place where I can explain it very well, but I'm just going to read 
um, the third piece in the series for you tonight. Tonight, there are no seats and there is no stage. We've been told to sit or stand anywhere. There are about 75 of us in various positions of sitting and standing when the theater director informs us that the show will be starting presently and that we should not touch the actors. We should also try not to move. But of course we are allowed to move. In fact, there may be moments when the actors gesticulate or order us to move. And in those cases, we must move. Furthermore, we should not judge each other for moving because if someone moves, it is probably because they need to. While viewing tonight's performance, we are to practice empathy for ourselves and our comrades. If prompted, then we can speak to the actors, but we are not to touch the actors under any circumstance. I'm standing on a milk crate against a column near the wall. I believe I have the best spot in the audience. An actor in a ball gown and combat boots enters. She has a natural beard and is holding a clipboard. She's wearing a headset, around 50, I'd say, but no gray. I wonder if she dyes her hair. She wanders around from group to group, arranging them so that there is a labyrinth of sorts. She organizes the standers into a circle with a few enter entry and exit points. She waits to deal with me last. And when she's done, I'm no longer on the milk crate. She exits with the milk crate and doesn't include me in the circle. The people who make the circle and those who sit in the circle observe what's happening with their round, still eyes. A new actor enters. They is wearing all black with a full balaclava, tinted goggles and black gloves. They gives me back the milk crate and exits. I wonder if this is going to be a performance of dominance, submission, and altruism. I don't feel like being submissive tonight. If someone else tries to take my milk crate, I will fight back. Another similarly clad insurgent enters carrying signs on sticks. Vote here, vote a key. The signs, the signs designs look like someone's child made them. Perhaps someone in the company's child wrote the play. I feel like an adult submitting to the whims of a child's game. More actors enter following the person in the ball gown with a headset and clipboard. She lines them up next to me and tells me I can keep my milk crate if I inform her if they misbehave. I agree. I'm excited about the idea of participating in the game and I really didn't want to have to fight for my milk crate privilege. Meanwhile, the signs go up along the pathway of people who sit within the human circle. The people in line eye me suspiciously and fidget their fingers with the hems of their shirt. One is looking around in a particularly furtive manner. They keep touching their inner jacket pocket. I clear my throat as an indication that they should stop. They reaches in and takes out some, some, some papers. I think they is threatening me. They take a step toward me, preferring the, the papers. I'm terrified. They're coming closer and closer. Princess, I shout. The woman in combat boots comes out and puts the paper pusher to the back of the line. The situation is miraculously diffused as if there was never any threat and order is restored. The people are allowed to vote. They move one by one through the various entry points of the labyrinth. They are trying to get to the voting booth, but they can't get to it. There are only dead ends in this maze. They bump into each other like figures from a 1980s video game. This keeps happening until the audience starts wondering if this is all the performance is. Not that it's not thought provoking, but either it needs to end or shift. I know I am not the only one who feels this way. We grow increasingly uncomfortable with the situation. The monotony starts to overpower. Anxious restlessness is palpable in the air. When suddenly a member of the audience decides to get up and move and stop blocking the path of the voters, the audience recognizes their power and acts. I feel terribly dense. The woman in combat boots tries to order other members of the audience back down to block the passage of voting acts 
this, but they refuse. She looks at me on my crate. I shake my head. I might have been naive before, but I see what's at stake now. The woman in combat boots physically blocks the rotors by yanking and shoving at them, and a scuffle ensues between the performers. The masked individuals with tinted goggles reappear and seem to be on the side of the combat boots. The audience is shouted at from multiple angles to get out of the way as the choreography of the scuffle becomes less predictable. They obey, not wanting to get hurt and stand in a huddle around me. I feel self-conscious on, on my milk crate, but I'm not about to give up my view. A gunshot is heard. People strain to see and spread around the commotion. No one in the scuffle fired the weapon. No one is shot. The woman in the combat boots shouts at the audience to get down. The shooter is coming. They drop. I squat on my milk crate. We're convinced of our own safety. The woman in combat boots is shot. She falls dead to the ground. The shooter enters. I hate women who act like men, he sneers. Meanwhile, the voters and the poll workers have overturned a table and use it as their barricade. They've set up a rifle. This is the autonomous voting rights zone, someone says. If you're not with us, you're against us. The shooter aims to shoot, but some audience members surround him. I am impressed. It hadn't occurred to me to use my right to move. It only occurred to me to stay out of the way. I keep watch from my perch. He pulls the water balloon and tosses it over their heads. It lands and bursts open at the barricade. The voters and poll workers are strewn like victims of a nightclub bombing. The theater director walks out, applauding. Excellent, excellent. The audience did what they could do, yet the system I put in place, do not touch the actors, prevented effective intervention. Great performance, actors and audience. We're looking forward to continuing this season with all of you. The lights come up and I want to dance with somebody comes on. The actors dance with the audience. I realize I am in a nightmare. I am a nightmare. I am in a nightmare. Um, it's interesting to share brand new work with no faces. Um, so I can just imagine that you all received it well. I'm going to now read from chronology um, and I'm going to share my screen with you and see and hopefully the technology works smoothly. September 25th, 2015. The anniversary of your death and two days after your birthday. I met your fiance today. He's the American guy from the Peace Corps who seemed so struck by your death on social media. I hadn't realized. I brought the Betty Boop figurine you gave me and for a few minutes sat her awkwardly on the hotel bar. He's the one who has continued, Bare Nere. He's kept your project alive with a writer from Lesotho. We are the American missionaries for your cause. He told me you weren't engaged, not officially, but you were planning on moving to DC to be with him. I would have visited you. We remembered how you would accuse us of working for National Geographic when we took your photo. He told me you were killed by a reckless German driver, a volunteer in Lesotho. Yours was the only life lost at 29. The driver was evacuated, forever unaccountable. The past is ever present. Dies. One who. Moshoe. Bashoe. Mutimeli. Batimeli, one who dies at home, Mushuela Habo, one who dies for others, Mushili Bashili, killed, 
by unknown people. Kosoroa ke notala. Katla kabona katse. I came, I saw, I took. Empire then is empire now. Empire there is empire here. Tuesday, this is a quote. Hurriedly, I took off my priest's garb, dressed, grabbed the cameras and raced for my car. I drove with ease, parked and waited. This tyranny of waiting, it should be blown right out of people's lives, the fucking stinking waiting at bus stops, railway stations, subways, traffic lights, shop counters, toilets, at the undertakers, at, at, at. 24th of December, 2009, Thursday. Yesterday was chapter two and we ended up in each other's arms, dancing, climbing narrow stairs with three glasses of water, dominoes with no introductions. A bed in another room, a bottle of the wandering grape, artsy atmosphere, young people, old barman, the coolest cat there. Quality tunes, low lighting, remembering red walls. Back home with chips, dancing, smoking across the threshold, turning, jazzing and jiving. Then I gave her water and said good night. 25th of December, Merry Christmas hangover. Drinking Sing Tao and watching sports, football, family list, solo Christmas under a warm blue sky around one o'clock, I would guess. I wonder what chapter three will bring. More imagination, more giggles, more cuddles. At an Asian restaurant, hip hop playing lightly, louder music on the street. I took the metro free today, gave a blind guitarist a rand, ignored man next to me who tried to ponder how much those guys make a day. Chapter three starts with me coming home. The key isn't working again. She comes to the door, opens it, goes back to bed, my bed, her bed. I'd been out all night. I went into the bathroom and cut off all my hair. We wanted those statues to be held accountable. Monday, May 11th, 2015. Dear Polo, you'd be sad to know about my country right now. Six police officers in the city of Baltimore, not too far from Washington, DC, caused the injuries of a young man that led to his death. The reason he was apprehended by police officers was because he started running when he saw them. We can assume he was scared. He had reason to be scared. They severed his spine. The police department is saying the others did nothing wrong. They're, the officers did nothing wrong. They're saying the young man caused his own injuries. They're standing by it. We think apartheid is over only to see it manifest from under a cloak. Like silhouettes, the ghosts of white supremacy are ever present, unseen puppet masters. Exposure is frequent these days in my country, but there are too many who refuse to see, to speak, to listen, to feel. Before you speak, this is a quote, there is a coercive framework ready to interpret, to trap meaning. If the language we use is in itself a prison, we have to put a bomb under the language, explode language. And this is um, my epigraph, Dumbudzo Marachera from Black Sunlight. Seeing the small, clean pink drops of memories, tiny pink drops like minute rubies, clung to the quartz of thoughts, grazed my brain. And from deep down there, my overarching yearning for a single glittering drop to sizzle the hot stony tongue. Language, knotted tightly around my eyes like a bandage made of headaches. Language, shards of a broken glued together mirror in it, 
nodding my tie. English images came out of the barn with a thousand Zulus at my heels. She found me wedged tightly between past and present. I held my emotions tightly. Mukani. Que nanyana que lelo, a turntable after wine at Tagore's turning you, we turning the reregi. The reregi. Que nanyana, I said, Bukansue, you said, before we met, Jesus Ale, Polokelo ia dibuka. After we met, Horata, unexplored, but aside for the future, Hokola ke marati, fa marata. I want, I want 7th Avenue open to 
Thank you, Zara, for that presentation. Um, I'm always really impressed when people manage to make Zoom feel less isolating um, and less claustrophobic. So I feel inspired by that. Um, Black Space actually came out today. Today is the official publication day of my book, Black Space on the Poetics of an Afrofuture. Um, my publisher says these books are in the mail, which means that at some point I will get a box of books. I'm waiting for that. I'm very excited. Um, it was six years in the making. Uh, I became an in 
completely different person <laughs> over the course of writing it. It was the longest time that I've ever spent working on any given thing. Um, so I, I feel like excited is even um, a sort of understatement about how I feel about Black Space being out. Um, but so I will share some sections of it with y'all today. Um, and some of this stuff I've never read before. So, uh, the book is sort of divided into their essays where I'm thinking about, um, well, there are essays and interviews and poems and the whole book is thinking about uh, ways that black digital media artists have worked towards liberation. Um, and I think about liberation in terms of the individual, so thinking about psychic liberation, um, the social, thinking about social liberation, um, protest, uh, and then a sort of more uh, universal or existential liberation um, that, you know, sort of Buddhist texts often deal with uh, nirvana or enlightenment, but um, there are many sort of uh, non-spiritual frameworks for thinking about that kind of liberation as well. Um, and it struck me that I had never, though I'd read books about freedom um, in terms of, you know, each of those lenses individually, I'd never seen a book that tried to sort of tie all three lenses together, um, and certainly not a book that tried to do that while thinking specifically about um, black artists. So that is sort of what I was trying to create um, when I wrote Black Space. The chapter that I'll start with a section from is called We Did Not Originate in the Cosmos, which uh, is a stolen line from the artist Martine Sims' mundane Afrofuturist manifesto. The chapter comes from talking to uh, a friend in France who runs an Afrofuturist organization there, um, and I changed her name for her privacy. So all the names are changed. We did not originate in the cosmos. In 1941, Odeon was called to war. A young man from Benin, he'd studied at William Ponty, a military school housed in an old fortress about 20 miles east of Dakar in Senegal. Odeon fought on France's side against the Axis powers in World War II. After the war, he immigrated to France, swayed by the propaganda promise of affirmative reception in France. Three decades later, in December 2015, I sat talking to his granddaughter over Skype. He was treated like shit, said Adelaide, suddenly from her Paris apartment. France did indeed see a rise in immigration after World War II from all over Africa. Take, for instance, the thousands of Algerian pied noirs who fled to France at the end of the Algerian War. It didn't take long for internal tensions to emerge in France between the nation's French Algerians and the larger French populace. In James Markham's 1988 New York Times article, For Pied Noir, the anger ensues. Former French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac is reported as saying, to reconcile France with its colonial past is to reconcile France with itself. As a lieutenant in Algeria, I did my duty. I hope I shared your hopes and your and your agonies and understood your elan. The last word, elan, struck me as glib. There is this big crisis in France regarding the national identity, said Adelaide. She held a cigarette in her hand. Adelaide acts as the executive director of an Afrofuturist arts organization, Afrofuturist Society. A few weeks earlier, Adelaide had just finished an interview with Mark Derry, the author often credited with coining the term Afrofuturism. I'd always had my reservations about the hubbub surrounding Derry, but Adelaide's interview re-sparked my interest in him. As an interviewer, she was tough and direct. I think it's just a matter of waves, said Adelaide referring to the period directly after World War II when the Pied Noir and other African immigrants struggled to find acceptance in France. She pointed out that before World War II, the Italians had been the nation's problematic immigrants du jour. Robin Cohen writes in the Cambridge Survey of World Migration, as regards the Italians, 
the mass influx of the years 1880 to 1930 was just one in a whole cycle of migrations which had been in progress since antiquity, or it could be said since prehistory. It is now estimated that about five million French nationals are of Italian origin if their parentage is traced over three generations. Adelaide estimated that it took about three generations for a new immigrant population to become properly integrated into the rhetorics of French nationality. In other words, three generations is the amount of time it takes for an Italian immigrant, for example, in France to become nominally French or even French-Italian. Naturally, integration functions somewhat differently for African-descended immigrants, whose very appearance seems to reify a perpetual foreignness. Modern-day French citizens who are descended from African immigrants are still likely to be called African in France and not French-African, Adelaide elaborated. This struck me, I found myself saying. In the States, when we think about immigration, we don't think about black Americans. That immigration was long ago enough. Even now, though, I'm not sure I was right. So that's a tidbit of that. Um, a lot of black space ended up being um, thinking about prior liberation movements like the Algerian War of Independence um, and black British feminism in the 70s and 80s um, and trying to garner lessons from those liberation movements about the present struggles that we're seeing as a way of not always feeling like uh, black struggles for liberation are starting from scratch, um, which is not to say that we don't make recourse to the civil rights movement, but there are also global movements, I think, that sometimes um, fall by the wayside when we think about um, American black struggles. So I'm going to go to the first chapter um, and read a section from there. This chapter is called Paradigms for Liberation, 1 to 3. It's easy to take for granted the invisible processes of narrative construction and deconstruction that go into the formation of our historical stories. Narrative is both an aesthetic and a political tool wielded by agents who hold power to produce some felt effect in a reader or in a colonial subject. Leading up to the start of the Algerian War of Independence in 1954, members of the Federation of Elected Muslims disagreed with each other about whether Muslim Algerians should assimilate to French culture or demand complete separation from France, which as a Christian country rejected Muslim Algerians' pleas for French citizenship. Years later, in the 70s, the General Assembly of the United Nations debated whether wars of national liberation should be protected under international law or if they should be considered illegal and punish or if they should be considered illegal and punishable forms of armed conflict. Both debates strike me as negotiations over a semantics of freedom, a decision about what exactly liberation will mean. The rise of the Black British feminist movement in the 1970s and 80s, which brought together Afro-Caribbean and South Asian British women, arose, at least in part, in response to the narrow scope of the women's lib movement as it had existed to date. The movement eventually fragmented and collapsed. Writers on the movement have often tried to name what caused its eventual fragmentation and collapse, as many writers have tried to do in response to the organized action actions at May 68 and Occupy Wall Street. In The Power of the Poor in History, Gustavo Gutierrez argues that liberation theology, by awakening memories of past struggles, elicits a special subversive kind of memory that then encourages the active reinterpretation of historical struggles. Today, I have many conversations about whether the interactivity of social media has elicited a special an uprising of newly empowered creative consumers to rewrite dominant hegemonic narratives of history, foregrounding those social agents whose voices and contributions have been effectively and nearly unconsciously erased from history. Whether remembering together and doing so subversively does indeed have the power to rewrite history and forge a healthier future, 
I'm inclined to believe that in the very least there is value in looking again at what already occurred at a time when what is up ahead seems uncertain at best. In the young Algerian from colony to province, Ferhat Abbas, who would later become the president of the provisional government of the Algerian Republic writes, Algeria is French territory. We are Frenchmen with Muslim personal status. Abbas's pronouncement wasn't corroborated by reality. The Young Algerian was published in 1931. By 1934, the number of Muslim Algerians who'd been allowed to become French citizens was only about 1,359. Given this, the extent of Abbas's allegiance to colonial France is shocking. He goes so far as to deny not just Algeria's sovereignty, but the existence of Algeria altogether. Algeria's war of liberation began in Satif, where Muslim protesters demanded the nation's independence in 1945. 100 European settlers, or Pied Noir, were killed in this initial uprising, and the French military killed between 1,000 to 45,000 Muslims in retaliation. I continue to find it unsettling how much sources disagree about the exact number of deaths. Around the same time in San Francisco, the UN had convened for the signing of the UN Charter of 1945, the foundational treaty of this new international governing body. Fifty states, including the United States and France, signed the UN into existence. The Charter articulated the UN's commitment to the human rights of the citizens of the world and outlined their standards of living and fundamental freedoms. By the end of that year, World War II came to a close. Abbas's appraisal of France was bolstered when it signed the UN Charter, but his earlier idealism about the colonial power had been shattered by the events at the outbreak of the war. In an address before the Algerian Constituent Assembly, Ferhat publicly denounced himself for having previously denied the existence of the Algerian state. Nine years after that initial remark, Ferhat had a change of heart, going on to accuse the French administration of provoking the crisis at Satif and of perpetuating violence against Muslims. A group of three women planted bombs at the milk bar at Place Bogar, the cafeteria on Rue Michelet, and at the Air France headquarters. This was the beginning of the Battle of Algiers. As I was thinking about the um, history of various liberation movements, um, I was also thinking about the history of um, Black artists' engagement with uh, digital media, specifically video art um, and radio. Uh, and I found that as I was trying to do research into black video artists, a lot of the work was um, siloed either at the Video Data Bank uh, in Chicago or the Electronic Arts Intermix in New York, which are the only two video art distributors in the country. Um, and in the same way that I feel like there's a loss when we think about present day liberation movements without thinking about previous global movements, there's a loss when we think about um, contemporary artists. Uh, I just got a text from my publisher saying that my book just arrived at his house. Yay! Okay. Um, there's a loss when um, we think about present-day black artists who are making work on social media and YouTube like Shawnee McElaine Holloway or Liz and Putu, um, but we don't make um, a connection to black video artists who are making work in the early 70s. Um, so in Becoming more interested in this idea of lineage, I went to these two places, Video Data Bank and Electronic Arts Intermix, and started to write um, poetry in response to the work that I was seeing, um, both as a way of making that content more accessible, at least if you can't see the videos, you can read um, my poems, um, but also as a way of expressing a kind of love or um, admiration for the work I was seeing. Um, so, I will read some of these poems. Um, the Kevin Drum Everson Cinnamon 2006, one hour, 10 minutes. Um, and this is about a feature length film called Cinnamon, experimental film about a group of black 
drag racers in rural Virginia. Kevin Jerome Everson Cinnamon, 2006, 1 hour, 10 minutes. Moves a woman in a field, her back to man, working the car who calls out to Aaron, moves slowly. What flavor you want, the alcohol. At a race, there are drag cars and normal cars. There are flowers, blueness of car and man's shirt, the garage window, and also in the grass and trees, air. Dynamics, cooler air means cars run quicker. Aaron in blue taking off another man, how he used to do his racing on the street from 1978 to 1982. You don't have to have the best car, luck of the draw, it's God's will, hands, feet inside the car, about to race once she starts, sound, fade, she's exiting, gives a piece to John, outside, a story about, after his delay box broke, after Larry beat him, respected him, John is trying to fix the car, as Aaron watches, she says, won't make it, John says, no, says it was stupid at first, but ultimately thrilling, 23 minutes, 10 seconds, the car picks up and drives, it isn't dead, the rurality of the surround, Ashley with cornrows says, I love you, no talking in drag, when she was seven, her dad got her a car, feels lucky, she has 20 trophies in her room, she's sitting on the bed, black and white and silent, getting settled inside John, and his influence is John, Ashley's father, Aaron, in a parked car, zoning out, Aaron works at a bank, and John is a mechanic, and at work, Aaron has her dreads pulled into a bun, whereas on the track, in a lot, in some kind of forest clearing, her hair is down, the saturation is different, a black people in bleachers, a young boy prepares to race, a family unloads groceries from car into house with American flag, that's what drag racing is, it's consistency, the same shot, four to five young white boys by the fence as Aaron is about to begin, we are inside a car, looking out the windshield and the closest we get. Ephraim Asili, Forged Ways, 2010, 15 minutes, 52 seconds. The sound from some other kind of space or craft and foot set in a downtown U.S. Shots into windows where flowers and mannequins with shots of impoverished walking downtown moves between that and a Caribbean nation ducks, pigeons. I'm almost certain the flag is in the clip you took as we see from the vehicle, the roadway and house and building alongside it and the castle bring me to think of colonialism and the environments in which ways of life are forged, the sound of moving through it, the sound of photos taken, finally arrives home where his white girlfriend takes photos. The two of them lounge. She puts up cutouts, religious sits, worship in the other nation, and constant roadways and cars behind a chant. In another language, the other location, is this Ethiopia? And you were right about Harlem. Uh, just read one more poem. Ephraim Asili, 
many thousands gone. 2014, seven minutes, 38 seconds. Is that we should begin in transit in or near a vessel as we do here? And then we leave this place and the skittering quality that follows, festive scene, song, and unaccompanied by diegetic sound has been replaced by this near music, robs these scenes of their reflection, the whole in this mood. Maybe it makes more sense to call it near silence, visually a richness. We learn the musician is Joe McPhee, the record of his we heard in migration, literal and signaled by the previous traveler going to places that exist only so romantic and incoherent. Thanks. Thank you, Zara. Thank you, Ann. I feel like um, there are so many uh, like conversations and lattices between your work. So thank you for that. And we'll have a we'll have a Q&A after we hear from the broadside artists. So let me just um, let me just tell you how what the lineup will be for um, the artists presentations. We have four of the artists who are going to share some some information about their design process for the broadsides they created. So we have um, Ronnie Gross, who created the broadside for Benjamin Kruisling's work. Um, we have Rachel Hillary, who worked on Mayfield Brooks broadside. And um, we have Linda Zeb Hang, who created Selena Sue's broadside. And then finally, we have Claudia Cortinez for Zara's work. And we'll, they'll present in that order. And after that, um, we will open it up for Q and A for um, for Ann and for Zara, and then also for all four artists. So, um, Ronnie, whenever you're ready to get started, welcome. Oops. Thank you, Asya. Um, okay. Um, I want to share with you some visual stuff, and I would like you to see. Um, Ben's poem to begin with, um, which I'll just read. So I don't know if this is exactly the way um, it was sent to me as a PDF, but it's something close to this. Okay, he's talking about a night of philosophy and ideas. And there's a question about the applicable value judgment. The window melts with rain, rain, rain sweatpants, glasses, it doesn't really matter. Conversation eats the memory of his face or demotes it, let's say. He's white and lives inside it. So um, I didn't have a lot of time for this because I wasn't the first person that was really slated to do this broadside. So I didn't have much of a back and forth with Ben. But I did ask him um, after reading this if there was anything further that he wanted to tell me about the poem. Um, and the other thing, it's called Portrait Four. And he said that he had written a number of portraits about friends, and this was one of them. So um, part of my thought process is what is the inflection of the voice that's speaking? And when I think about that, I think about what might be the typeface that would convey that. So when I read this, I had, there was a certain tonal quality to the first two lines that I thought was different than the last lines. And so I just did kind of a mock-up on my computer, knowing that the fonts and the wood type that I would ultimately use might not match this exactly. But I just wanted to play around with an idea of sort of an abstract portrait. Um, and so this is what I came up with, um, not being married exactly to the colors and knowing that the quality of the wood type might be quite different. So 
I was reasonably happy with this, except that I felt that it was kind of lacking some texture. And one of the reasons why I wanted to use wood type for the big um, shapes is because they're old and they're worn, and so they're not perfect. And that would give me some texture. So you're also seeing the difference, you know, that the first two lines are in a serif typeface that is sort of formal. And then the last lines are in a sans serif, smaller and maybe more, I don't know, casual or uh, more familiar. Uh, so now I'm gonna show you some process shots of the beginning work. So what you're seeing here, um, the O and the three are wooden um, type and the um, square is a foam that you can cut and you can ink it up. So one of the interesting things about letterpress is that the ink is more transparent than offset printing and so you get the bleed through of the colors which I thought also worked for the text. Um, and so this is the addition of another element and you see that it is different from what I originally did because I couldn't find um, an E, not that I was focusing on it as an E, but a shape that I felt worked. And so I came up with these, I mean, actually L's and a T or I's and a T, um, you know, in an abstract way to maybe suggest some sort of a face. Um, and the colors also suggesting a certain type of person who was perhaps satisfied with themselves in a way. And then um, this is the resolution of it. And I don't know if you can see close to the top, blind embossed are, is the title portrait for. So um, I, you know, I felt that Benjamin made a portrait of a person with language and I made a portrait of a person visually. Um, and so I had a certain amount of conflict about speaking tonight because I just felt like, what is there for me to say and should I be speaking at all? And I asked, I showed Benjamin this um, broadside and I asked him how he felt about my speaking and he said, I feel that the content of the poem is open to a number of thoughts and, inter and interpretations, even though what probably rings loudest is a note of soft condemnation or critique. I'm not sure it's only or completely that. Who doesn't live inside their experience? The point probably is to change it. And I think the poem in its soft way asks some questions about vision, naming, perception, judgment, and more. Thank you. Hear um, more about the broadside. I'm gonna share my screen right now. Um, and pull up uh, my PDF, which is right here. So um, I worked with Mayfield Brooks's poem after Toni Morrison, and uh, Mayfield and I had a chance to meet in the very early days of the quarantine, and we actually met on Skype. Uh, it was that early, we didn't even have Zoom yet in our lives. Um, and in our discussion, uh, this is Mayfield's poem on the screen, and in our discussion, Mayfield spoke about their relationship with Toni Morrison and how this poem was created in a series of poems written after her death in 2019. And um, how this poem in particular had four voices and um, really individual characters. And, and to them, the central question was, who are we without her? And really speaking, 
from a black female writer perspective. Um, and I was really drawn to this poem, it's, it's relation to the ancestry and, um, and lineage and the agency within the words and how each one seemed to be very carefully considered. And originally my thought was like, this is a letter and this, and because the center has such incredible type, like I can really work with this collection type and really choose the voices really specifically. Um, and this isn't really early draft, but as the, um, as the months from March went on and the Black Lives Matter protests started, I realized that, that this, um, this like quiet letter that I had in mind wasn't the right approach, that it really was about um, something much more connected to the agency of Toni Morrison and the agency of passing along books and ideas. And, um, and I started to evolve the type to be more about a, a conversation and started to develop a lino cut to um, sort of connect uh, the forms. And this is the lino cut without the type on it. Um, and, and I was working with paper that's like this tiny, it's a tiny bit of blush. It's like almost a pink and the, um, there's an orange um, uh, fade that that's, goes over the lino cut to create it. Um, a look that's almost like uh, sparks or like sort of a afterglow of a fire. And here's the uh, lino cut that was created. Um, and, and this is the final broadside and I, I, I put together the font, which I finally tuned uh, to the different, the four different voices that um, Mayfield discussed, trying to, trying to get them the character right, um, the size right, um, and um the 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 pacing uh right um yeah so those are the the design components i was really working with were color um fonts and um and the layout um and it um it i think the size itself it's 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 about a letter size a little bit little bit off of a letter size so it retains some of that intimacy, but I think the um, energy is much more palpable than the original thought that I had when I first encountered the poem back in February. And I think it makes a really satisfying stack. So, um, so thank you so much. It was um, a really, it was an honor to work with Mayfield's words and to um, work on this project. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay, I'm on. Um, so I worked with uh, Selena Sue on um, designing and printing her uh, poem. And let me uh, share my screen now. So I can show y'all. Okay, so this is the poem that uh, she wrote. And it's called uh, A Hand, A Question. And it goes, an unflattening, a grasping, in the dark recesses of collective knowledge I did not know we held, could hold, for what can be. It's um, printed on Joss paper. And Joss paper, for me, uh, holds a, a unique um, uh, connection in that um, it's normally used in ancestral worship rituals as burnt offerings. And in burning this Joss money, um, it's a common act of worship, supplicating the gods and providing the spirits with uh, currency uh, for the afterlife. And um, in this case, the poem is the spirit guide that sanctions language to another dimension. Joss paper is also fundamental in healing circles to pay off karmic debt in the earthly realm. And as we've seen here um, in the States, seen a lot of things burn. And I wanted to use Joss as a way to present the pliable state 
of Selena's writing, but also um, to represent um, as a, an offering to um, to what's happened, to make amends, to to heal, and to um, to get back to craft in terms of like um, uh, hand um, carving, as well as um, custom typefaces as well. Every single one is unique, hand burnished, many layered over. And as you can see, um, details of the carving blocks that I did. This was the uh, original form that came out of the poem. And um, Joss paper is really amazing to fold and um, is normally considered as like waste paper, but um, there's an element of spirituality in it as well. And when you fold it in such a way as I did, which is a lattice, and lattice for me holds uh, information exchange as well as um, to gesture um, some kind of flight movement, which is very inherent in um, Selena's poem, as well as um, for burning um, ceremonies and things like that. Um, this is a close-up shot. And the typefaces are unique, at least for me, because um, I'm currently on the West Coast and shamanism and counterculture are big um, influences in um, the way that I think about uh, race, migration, and uh, uh, sincerity and earnest in um, anti-racist uh, curricula. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Are we leaving? Hi, Claudia. Um, um, I think I am going now so I'm I'll, I'm going to share my screen oh, sure. um, so yeah my name is um, Claudia Cortinez and I was working with um, with Zara's poem um, which is a transcription from uh, an NYPD walkie-talkie um, and I selected this poem. Um, this was like, this was before COVID. Um, this was before any um, of the current protests, um, like Black Lives Matter protests. And I was really interested in the way the text um, sort of described, first of all, was a really like poignant memory for me in New York City. Um, this was like right before I moved out of New York City and it was like, um, I was like such a sort of like memorable kind of like visceral time connected to the city. Um, and, um, and it was also like such a marker, the poem is such a marker of like different um, like spots and sort of textures of the city. Um, so that was like a real interest um, for me in thinking about um, like I, you know, work a lot with um, like images and sort of surfaces that reference um like kind of parts of um like urban situations and architecture and when i started working on the broad side um i was also kind of you know participating in the the protests that are happening currently um and you know taking a lot of photographs also of the way the city has been altered and this was like this is i'm sharing this image here because this was um sort of a like material inspiration for what I wanted to think about um, with the print in this like um, graffitied boarded up window um, that you can sort of see that says like Black Lives Matter on it, but it's also been painted over. Um, and it was something that when I came upon this site, I didn't even really realize it until I photographed it because the flash on the camera like picked up that hidden layer of paint um, behind it. So I was thinking about how like text like legibility and how um, 
yeah, how like um, something could appear from a certain angle and then disappear from another angle. Um, so um, I'm going to cycle through. So the, the process that I worked with um, for Zara's print was um, hand dyeing uh, the, you know, 100 sheets of paper. Um, so each print is like vastly different. Um, and I'm going to just sort of cycle through um, like a selection of them just to give a sense of um, the variety, I guess, um, because the way that the, the ink sort of sits in the page also affects the way that the, the letter press on top of it um, reads. So there's the, there's the initial like hand, hand dyeing of the paper. And then um, I worked with the letter press and using a, a silver ink, which um, is reflective. So when you hold it from different angles, it either becomes darker or lighter. So like the, either the, the text becomes more visible or the, the X's become more visible. And um, also these like X's, which were um, laid out on the, um, with like traditional like woodblock uh, uh, fonts. I was thinking about those also as a reference, um, A, of like this kind of aerial view of a protest. So the X is becoming um, sort of um, illustrating uh, people in a protest, maybe from above, but also they sort of look like the uh, like non-slip, um, like metal kind of grating and um, like fencing and things that you see all over the place in cities. Um, so um, yeah, this is just like some details and so now I'm just gonna cycle through um, a selection of these, which is shows sort of the variation of the dyeing and how the dyeing um, affects the, the ink and, and also the legibility. So with each of these, there's like a real material uh, presence to the paper. And um, with some of the prints that are, that are less uh, leg legible, it's like you have to sort of shift the, the page to pick up the, um, the reflectivity of the silver ink to, to really read the, either the poem or to see the X's. And also the way the X's um, kind of uh, interfere uh, with the text or, or, or activate the text was something interesting for me um, when working on these. And so for the background, um, which was the, the dyed uh, the dyed paper, again, I was like thinking about um, like the stains on sidewalk, the stains on um, yeah, the stains on concrete, and the sort of um, organic uh, yeah, like urban sort of palette um, as a space to kind of overlay the the text and image from. Um, and that's it. But yeah, I was so grateful to um, also to be working with this particular uh, poem and in this time. And um, yeah, I loved this project. So yeah, thank you, Zara. Like, I guess I have to stop sharing. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia and Linda and Ronnie and who am I forgetting, Rachel. Um, thanks to all of you so much. It's so interesting to hear about your processes and um, they, and just, yeah, hear about how, how you came to, to what you finally came to and like the evolution of it. And um, it feels so dynamic and alive and also this like conversation that happens um, with each of the writers as well. Um, so we have some time to take some questions. And um, if you have a question that you would like to ask, please feel free to do so. Um, you can just put it into the chat and ask the question and, um, and then I'll just ask it to the, to the whole group. Um, so you can feel free to do that anytime. But I think just to start us off, I have a question. It's a little bit 
unformed. Um, it's a little unformed, but I will try and present it anyway, and maybe something will form as I ask it. Um, it's a question that has to do with looking back and looking again and and like what it what it means to to look again um, in the sense of like using found material using found like using found things and what it means to like refine them and to think of ways to make them make them I don't know I guess make them new or make them um, like apply them in new ways and I'm wondering how I'm wondering how I guess like how lineage how like how lineage figures into your own work and then also um, An and Zara both of you also teach and I'm wondering how like what the role of lineage is in finding something and like looking again like how those ideas play into what you teach and how you teach it's a slightly um, moving in a slightly different direction, but it's something I've been thinking about, especially in the context of both of your work. And if either of you want to answer it, or if no one wants to answer it, I can ask an entirely different question. I'm happy to go first. Okay. Um, I, I also just want to say thank you to Claudia. I was really uh, yeah, I was just really blown away by your process. Um, Claudia and I haven't really spoken. We had maybe one or two uh, email exchanges, which is really cool. Um, so this was deeply, um, yeah, it was, it was just really wonderful. I'm a little at loss for words. Um, and it was wonderful to see all of the artists um, share their process also. I love, um, I love thinking about process. Lineage is an interesting word. I actually wrote it down during Ann's reading and thinking about lineage and um, I like that it's been applied to this idea of, um, of finding and finding and, and looking at things in new ways and then also thinking about what I'm teaching. I, I'm currently teaching uh, African American history and I'm teaching high school students and I'm about to tonight actually they are encountering um, CUNY professor Herman L. Bennett's um, 2019 work African Kings and Black Slaves. Um, it's an amazing text it's difficult for me so I, I feel guilty giving it to the high school students but what he's done um, is gone in to an existing archive that has been read in, in certain ways. And he's reformulating the 15th century encounter between African kings and Portuguese kings. Um, so just kind of thinking about lineage in the archive and, and finding and refinding and thinking about things in new ways is kind of um, what I'm trying to do right now. And in, with my students, but then also um, with that piece that I made um, is interesting to, you know, when Claudia chose that poem, it was, you know, it's definitely a found poem. It's not really even a poem. I can't really, I don't really think of it as a poem, but it's, um, it's a piece of writing that is kind of in a poem form. And it made me go back to those that you know a couple of hours of footage that um of audio footage that i had recorded so many years ago and had just left and some of it has been lost like and um yeah so just kind of going in and looking again and finding new meaning um but also it's kind of interesting to think about the way like we can just apply the past to the present so it's like finding new meaning but then also seeing how um how everything i don't know maybe like how static our reality is in ways um which is kind of a more um, 
it's a sadder way to look at it than I had intended, but I've kind of, I've come to, a, a, yeah, a kind of sad end. Uh, Zara, do you, do you mean static in the sense that he, like, here we are again, like, I mean, in thinking about um, the, the images that you, that you are showing us, the images from, you know, 50s, 60s, civil rights movement. Um, I mean, there was, there was, of course, like a, a, a pain and a sadness and seeing, I mean, it, it like just, you know, it puts it in such high relief seeing those images paired with text or with audio that's so recent. Um, do you mean static in the sense that um, like things will not change? Like what kind of, what kind of static, what kind of static? I would never say things will not change. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but just how relevant um, the past is to the present is a little unnerving sometimes. I think, I think for me, as I was r reading about different liberation struggles, I like it is that double sadness of of sort of seeing that situations like the one that we're in have happened before, but also the way that. Um, people have been sort of grappling with the same kinds of decisions in different contexts for a long time. Um, and so thinking about ideas of um, immigration and belonging and nationhood and um, as an immigrant being sort of uh, held in a liminal space by the nation that you're trying to become a part of, um, are are these sort of like eternally recurring themes maybe or maybe hopefully i shouldn't say eternally recurring but <laughs> um are these recurring themes and i guess yeah it's it's this comfort of um maybe taking some advice or or feeling inspired by ways that people have dealt with similar struggles in the past um and i guess it just depends which part you highlight like if you highlight the fact that something similar is happening again, or if you highlight the fact that because something similar is happening, there's some advice that we can rely on. <laughs> um, and honestly, the part of that that I focus on depends on the mood that I'm in on any given day. Um, I think for students, what I'm hoping is that like through sharing my own archive and my own sort of research practice with them that they will feel inspired to do their own research. Like I, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that they need to get excited about everything that I'm excited about, um, but that they, to sort of model that there are, there's this whole body of work and documents and artifacts that um, is there to be found if you go looking for it. Um, yeah. And, I, and I've been thinking, I guess, about there's just music outside my window. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, but like uh, models of power, horizontal models of power and horizontal sociality um, and thinking about being in community with artists who are making two generations ago um, and not just in community with artists who are living now. Um, and that is a middle zone between thinking about or feeling connected to one's ancestors or one's kind of larger roots and feeling connected to who one's immediately around. There's like this middle space of like 50 to 100 years ago, um, can we be in community with, with those people? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think there's a question for the, let's see, there's a question. I think it's for all the broadside artists. Um, the question is, uh, to what extent did color choice affect the work or the media product used, if any, if you can quantify it? I'll read it again. To what extent did color choice affect the work or the media product used, if you can quantify it? I mean, anyone's free to answer that question. 
Um, I can speak about that a little bit. Um, because, um, you know, in the text, uh, Benjamin was talking about things dissolving into other things. Um, I felt that the palette needed to be kind of grayed back to some extent. Um, and, but also um, in my sort of drawing the portrait of this person, um, I was thinking of a palette that I don't know if preppy is exactly the word that I would use, but, um, you know, something that would suggest a person being very um, sort of comfortable in themselves without, uh, you know, feeling very sure of themselves without blasting it. You know, I guess maybe the way that you might think of old money or something. <laughs> you know, people who have had money for a long time, you know, that they're, they're um, maybe muted, you know, they're not, um, they're not screaming about themselves, but um, there's a certain maybe quietness about their surety. So that was kind of what I was thinking about and also how the colors would interact with each other to blend where they did overlap. So, you know, some of my concern, as I said, was to use the, um, the age of the wood type and its inconsistencies as something that would add texture um, to the portrait. Um, I can speak to that question too. Um, and yeah, in my case, um, I was really thinking specifically of um, like a kind of dirty city street, um, but how that can be beautiful. So um, this like, like the grays in um, like a concrete slab um, and the sort of, yeah, inconsistencies that can come from like some liquid that's stained on top of it. And it was the like tonalities that came from, um, or that came into the dyeing process were um, just like subtleties in the, the dye that I was using, um, which was primarily like gray and like a, yeah, like a, like a gray dye and also like a um, like a copper and rust. Um, so I was like just thinking about those like materials and those colors. And then for the ink, um, I wanted to use the silver because I was thinking about that like reflective property of something that would um, that would like shift depending um, which angle you're looking at it. And um, that would also, yeah, like from sort of like a skewed angle, the, the reflective silver would blend into the background color. So it was more like, and all of this was, was again, kind of inspired from that initial photograph that I shared, which was like the painted over door with graffiti. Um, so it was like that reflectivity and gray and concrete. Linda, I think you're saying something, but you're muted. Hello? Hey. Okay. Um, for me, I was interested in uh, thinking about Joss paper as a form of um, uh, material that could be pasted up in the streets and acting as flyers or, or um, and, and um, using the carved uh, type um, as a way to connect to the craft of the hand, as well as embodying um, the poem, which even though it's very, very short, it's very open-ended and also incredibly deep and spiritual as well. And the, the Joss paper is actually, it actually came with the silver foiling as well as the gold foiling. 
And um, so when I did the carving, I wanted to focus on the negative space um, of, uh, of weaving um, and then um, use these block type treatments as a way to facilitate um, a kind of spatial, emotional um, vibe on paper. So it's, um, for me, it, there's a lot of, there was a lot of effort into um, making the prints happen and um, I wanted everything to be done by hand and not by machine. And I think that's why the way that I have it installed, it's like as if you're outside and you're seeing color, which I didn't see for a long time as being in Manhattan it was completely gray and barren during the first months of COVID. And I think that um, the colors that I chose, which is brown, black, and green, um, signify uh, regeneration, deepness, solidarity, and um, becomes sort of like a soil to, to, uh, to grow new, new paths, new networks of language that we can, that we can then use to, um, uh, to talk about um, things that we don't want to talk about, you know, having it be as accessible as it can be to the public and to people so that it can be read and felt. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay, does anyone else want to say anything? No? Okay, there's a question. And I'm also really interested in exactly what Gabriel Seville just asked. And this is the question, because the Joss paper makes me think of spirit as material and content and all that we've heard and seen tonight. I'm wondering if the poets might want to speak on spirit or if they consider their work to have any relation to spirit work. So oh, yeah, for me, it's uh, um, I love that question. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think that everything that I do is related to spirit work because the culture that I came up from, um, you know, my uncle's a shaman, like that was like the first sort of performance that I, you know, remember and can recall, like from the earliest of my memories, which was like, you know, these these beautiful like like temples that were just we pasted with you know joss paper and then there's the drums you've got people dancing you've got music like it's for me i think i guess in using joss paper i'm trying to to conjure up these sorts of feelings or memories from ancestral lineage and to 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 give face to type as well and poetry and uh yeah that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> everything is spirit. <laughs> um, were you going to say something? I was just going to say I, that I love that question and and concur. It's everything. <laughs> um, and I think the in thinking about like spirit or spiritual. Uh, freedom that feels like the one form of freedom besides like psychological the one form of freedom that is sort of immediate and that can provide sort of immediate rejuvenation rejuvenation as sort of i'm working towards psychological freedom which is like healing and self-care and all these things that are lifelong processes um and then social freedom which I don't even know what the end point of that is or when we will get to something like that, but also feels like a lifelong project. Um, and so in thinking about spirit, my own spirit and the spirits of others, like that's the one sort of place that I can go and feel um, immediately free or immediately kind of uh, affirmed. Um, yeah. Zara, what about you? I wonder if there's 
Yeah. So there, yeah. Well, actually, I'm reminded of um, our exchange earlier today in thinking about, um, and thank you for your question, Gabrielle. Um, in thinking about spirit and conjuring, and I started, I recorded myself on Zoom practicing reading chronology. And then I was, I hit play today, but I had already hit play in somewhere else without realizing it. So all of a sudden I was listening to myself um, reading the first piece from chronology that I read, which is um, remembering my friend's um, anniversary of her death and the anniversary and her birthday. Um, and kind of hearing that on loop um so it was it was very haunting so kind of thinking about how our own writing can haunt us um and then also thinking about the ghosts that haunt us i guess that kind of goes back to the first question um about lineage i don't know if i have anything to say but it just it does make me start thinking so I don't know what will come of these thoughts, but I appreciate the question a lot. Yeah, I do as well. I don't know what I can say about it right now, but um, but I yeah, I mean, haunting and ghosts and lineage have been so front of mind lately in these past months as as everything just starts to like, I don't know, it feels like such long loops and persistent loops these past months. And um, I don't know, maybe that's just how it always is, but it feels especially um, like that space feels especially available to access in these past months. And um, yeah, I wonder if you guys have any questions for each other. You're, you're welcome to ask any if you do. <laughs> I guess I was interested in um, language fragments and your relationship to uh, bringing other languages into your work. Yeah, I um, I think I've always been interested in and language and sound just having grown up in New York and being around languages and sometimes identifying them and sometimes not being able to identify them. Um, so I think kind of sound and sound that I don't know what it means lives in my head. Um, and, but I think in terms the, with fragments, I definitely look to visual artists. So thinking about um, Romar Bearden or Wangechi Mutu, I think um, when it came to the form of chronology and the sound fragments are actually being inspired by visual fragments. Um, but yeah, and I wonder actually to, to kind of continue on your question and, and send it back to you and thinking about um, you know, how language informs your work and thinking about immigration. Um, I spoke French before I spoke English as a kid, like I was born in Haiti um, and then moved to the States when I was like three and a half. I don't know how much three-year-olds actually speak, but I had to learn English when I moved to the States. Um, and my sort of adolescence was a process of my family trying to like re-inculcate French and me sort of um, refusing it. But I think I've stayed interested in, um, I, I speak Creole um, fluently, but I've stayed interested in like the way that French functions in Haiti, which is that like mostly, most people just speak Creole um, and like billboards and things like that are all in Creole. And then sort of as a display of class or like government documents are written in French. 
Um, and so these sort of like the way that like colonial languages function um, to signal kind of power has always been interesting to me, um, not just in the context of Haiti, but in, in a lot of um, global cultures. So I think I've always been interested in like the language based aspect of uh, anthropology and like studied anthropology in college alongside poetry and they were they felt like um, they felt like they were related to me um, in terms of thinking about where language comes from and the social work that language performs um, which I I was resonating in your reading when you were talking about I think like exploding language I can't remember the verb but um, I often think about that like wanting to start over with language and wanting to not have a version of English where like dark or black has these negative connotations in addition to referring to like my skin, you know, and people like me. Um, so long rambly windy answer, but that's sort of what some stuff I think about. Also, um, that line that you pulled out, that was um, Akil, Ashil Mbembe. Um, who said that, so. <laughs> hmm. Well, that somehow feels like a good, like a good place to, to, not to end, but just to like, for now, for now. Um, I want to thank you, Ann, and thank you, Zara, and thank um, the Center for Book Arts and Jenna and all the artists who joined us and everyone who came tonight. Um, yeah, it's such a, it's such a, um, I'm happy that we had a chance to gather. It feels important to gather right now. And even though we gather in this way on Zoom, it, um, I don't know, it feels like there's a, there's an, like an intimacy that we could kind of cultivate tonight. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And um, I just want to remind people, it's 8.27 now. If you are interested in getting a broadside, um, you can purchase one on the event page. It's open until 9. And um, yeah, if people don't have any more questions, I think we'll, we'll say our goodbyes. And thank you. And see you all around the town, Zoom town and otherwise. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye.